Okay, well, thank you very much uh, for, for that and um, for the invitation to, to address you all this evening. So, uh, as has been said, th this uh, lecture series deals with moral challenges of, of global politics. And I suppose the, the challenge that I'm looking at is that of the fragmentation of left and right in contemporary politics. It's and the pluralization of different political views and the dilemma that that poses for democratic politics because um, that fragmentation makes the need for compromise in politics ever greater. Uh, compromise particularly in the formation of coalitions, for example, when, when forming governments. And I really want to look at, at uh, two issues which arise from that. First, are such compromises moral uh, in themselves? Or, or when you compromise, are you in a certain sense giving up your principles in order to just achieve power? And the second and related point is, are such compromises democratic? How do they fit with democracy? Because if politicians have been elected to do one thing, then uh, with what justification is it that they can then perhaps promise to do something totally different as a result of compromising with what have been their, their political enemies in the election. So that's the, the moral dilemma that I'm looking at. And I suppose for, for someone from Britain, it was all made very salient with the uh, 2010 UK uh, election, which produced this. And of course, in Germany, coalitions uh, or no one party winning an outright majority uh, in your parliament is, is the norm rather than the exception. But in the UK, uh, in national politics, it's the exception rather than the norm. In, for those who don't know the UK, I should say that in local politics, it's about 40-60 that you get coalitions formed. So it's not something which the political parties are necessarily unfamiliar with, at least local politicians. And in our new regional parliaments, the Northern Ireland parliament is actually designed to have coalitions at its core. Um, and as was intentionally the Scottish parliament, but that hasn't worked out that way because we now have a majority Scottish Nationalist Party. But as you can see here, we, we have no, given that you need 326, the Conservatives as the largest party fall short of that. Uh, and the dilemma for politics was therefore that the Conservatives could have either uh, formed what we call a minority government with a confidence and supply agreement with parties. That is, that they wouldn't form a coalition with them, they would just uh, support their budget, um, or it could enter into a coalition with other parties. Technically, Labour could just about have done it if it formed a coalition with all of the others. And there was an attempt to see if they could do that. But uh, in the end, the only really viable coalition was thought to be Conservative and Liberal Democrat, which is what ultimately happened. So, there we are. So, as I said, it's unusual in the UK, nor elsewhere. Uh, some people thought that the whole advantage of our plurality system, that is a system of, of politics where the party with, which wins the largest share of the vote in each constituency gets the seat, was that it was uncompromising. It, it didn't require compromises. Uh, so... But here we are with a situation where 
because of the fragmentation, if you go back here, you can see that one of the problems has been the growth of, of nationalist parties. Uh, amongst the others, you also have the Welsh nationalists. Because of this fragmentation, uh, you've got that. So, is the need for compromise, is the question I want to ask, one of democracy's uh, moral limitations? Does it show that politics is simply about power and pragmatism rather than principle? Or is it a strength? Is it something which leads to inclusiveness amongst people? And does political compromise therefore reveal a certain moral ambivalence and ambiguity about both democracy and politicians? Uh, are politicians unprincipled if they compromise on our behalf? Or are they, in some respects, actually uh, responding to, to issues for um, responding to the electorate and the, and, the dis and the distribution of votes that you have? Well, I think there are basically two views which are, you put forward. One is the, the negative view, which I just thought about loud. That is, that the need for compromise is symptomatic of a moral vacuum at the core of democratic politics. But politics is just about bargaining, about trading, about pork barrel. The politicians are unscrupulous in the pursuit of power. And what that suggests is that politics is basically unprincipled in its very nature. So it's better if you take principles outside of politics, see them as being constraints on politics, rather than something that's debated within politics. And you can see this in the way in which, um, for example, there's been a steady constitutionalization of politics so that uh, rights in particular are seen as moral legal moral constraints on what goes on inside politics, that more and more issues are taken out to be looked at and, and dealt with by specialist bodies. And so that leaves politics as something which is I said the not about principles at all. It's just about what can be done in an unprincipled way, because in a sense you have these constraints on the politicians which solve all the principled issues or all the settled issues. Um, so that is, is a development, even in the UK, which has a, a political constitution, gradually there's been a development of that judicialization of politics. But against that, you can have a positive view. And that says that compromise is a way of showing different views, equal concern and respect. It's, it's a way in which you can hearken to uh, the other side. And according to this view, what's good about politics is that it is about principles, that, that principles play a major role in in our, our politics, but we disagree about what our um, what what principles we favour, and so in a certain sense, given that it's unlikely in pluralist societies that any one group is ever going to be able to impose its view on everybody else, it becomes necessary to enter into a principled compromise with other views. And this is actually something which democracy invites to the extent that democracy is about giving everybody equal concern and respect and giving one vote to everybody and enshrining political equality in decision making. Then democratic politics is something which invites principled compromise. It's, it's, it shows that democracy can be about morals, rather than putting, if you like, morality outside of politics, simply as a constraint upon it. And it's this positive view that I want to, to argue for. Because the 
the immoral view is somewhat paradoxical in a way. It, it suggests that politics is most unprincipled when it's about principles. There's a sort of, because compromise is almost inevitable in any mature democracy. It sort of says, well, you just sim you shouldn't compromise, and hence you've got to keep your principles out. You've just got to make pragmatic concessions on policies, which are of a minimal nature. And one of the things I'm going to suggest to you is that that just proves an incoherent and impossible thing for democratic politics to seek to do. So you can't escape having principled compromise. It also suggests that compromises, which are the stuff of politics, are necessarily undemocratic and a betrayal of voters by politicians. And again, I want to suggest to you that, that, that just, if that was true, we'd have to give up on democratic politics. Instead, it's a perfectly coherent and even necessitated by democracy that you should have compromises. So the aims of, of the paper are, are therefore to defend a moral view of democratic compromise and show that politicians can compromise without compromising themselves. And I'm going to, to, to do this by sort of three uh, stages. First, I, I'm, <coughs> I'm going to show <coughs> that you, you must and you can compromise on principles without being unprincipled. Then I'll show that principle compromise follows from the ethos of democracy. So not only is it moral, but it's also something which is an essentially democratic thing to do. And then finally, I'm going to say, show how it's possible for representatives, for politicians, to compromise on our behalf without compromising their voters or themselves. Or themselves. But again, that only proves coherent and only possible to the extent that politicians actually engage in principled compromise. So in a certain sense, I realise that what I'm saying is perhaps a little bit counterintuitive for a lot of people, because the tendency is people always sort of say, oh well, you know, when, for example, the Liberal Democrats engaged in that coalition with the Conservatives, they must have thrown away their principles in order to do it. And instead, I'm going to use some, of, um, some details from that agreement to show that actually the only way in which they were able to compromise was to the extent that they did so on the basis of principles. And actually, as soon as you begin to look at it through the eye of policies, the whole thing begins to fall apart. The crux of, of the argument, I think, uh, is rests on a solution to, to uh, a, a famous theoretical paradox in the theory of democracy, which was put forward by uh, a UCL political philosopher called Richard Volheim in an essay, oh, I think it must date back to the early 60s. And in that, uh, Volheim said that democracy involves a, a paradox. Uh, and the paradox is this, that <clears throat> say I'm a committed Democrat, and so I think that whatever democracy says is the right answer that we should follow for our state. But the choice in the democratic decision-making is, say, do we have austerity policies to get us out of the crisis, or do we have uh, inflationary spending, public spending policies? So I vote for public spending, but the democratic decision is austerity. And that means that I'm committed to austerity because I'm, as a committed Democrat, but I'm committed to public spending in my own view, and that seems paradoxical because I'm, I'm committed to two incompatible views. So 
What I'm going to claim is that if we can solve that paradox, if we can show there's a way in which it's coherent to deal with that, we'll also solve what I call the representation paradox, which lies at the heart of people's views about compromise. Because the representation paradox is this, that the voter, I've not only voted for public spending, so, but, uh, and so I've expected my representative to support public spending. But then what happens if my representative, who has told me that they're in favour of public spending in the election, then goes and forms a coalition with the, with the party which is committed to austerity measures. It seems that the voter has been traduced even more than he would have been just because his party didn't get enough votes and so austerity is, is the name of the game. And the politician seems also to have produced their, their view, their commitment. So what I'm going to suggest later on is that there's a way of resolving the Walheim paradox which also gives you a solution to what I've called the representation paradox, which is like a, an, an added twist to that. And the solution partly lies in seeing compromise as being not simply about principles, but in a sense principle that's flowing from a democratic ethos and being, in a sense, a norm for democracy. That if you're committed to democracy, you should be uh, committed to, to compromise. So, uh, so let me start now with, with the first section of the paper, which, as I said, was going to be about showing that compromise is necessarily principled and not purely pragmatic. So, I'm going to break up each section with a little cartoon and hope to give you us all a little bit of relief. <laughs> because there aren't any jokes in the paper itself. Um, so what is compromise? Well, uh, compromise is uh, necessarily interpersonal and collective but also intrapersonal. It means that you get less than you feel entitled to. So, you know, if I'm bargaining in a, uh, <coughs> in, a, in, a trade, in a market over the price of a hat, and I think the hat is worth 10 pounds, and the trader, thinks it's worth 20 pounds, but we compromise on 15, then in a sense, both of us will feel, you know, if I, if I really thought, really this hat is only worth 10 pounds, I've compromised not only with the trader, but also with myself, because I'm, I feel that really I was entitled only to spend 10 pounds on it. And likewise, the trader, if the trader thought, really, he ought to get £20 for it, they've also, getting less than they're entitled to, feel in, uh, that, that they feel they're entitled to in going for £15. It assumes disagreement and the wish to agree despite disagreeing. So, in my trading example, uh, the assumption here is that we disagree over what, the, what this hat is really worth. But nonetheless, uh, the trader wants to make a sale, and I want a hat. So despite our disagreement, there's an incentive to agreement. And as I say, it involves acceptance of an inferior position. I would have liked to have it at 10 pounds, the trader would have liked to have got £20 for it. But it's voluntary acceptance, and that means it must be a Pareto improvement on the status quo for each person involved. I must feel 
that uh, it's better to have a hat at £15 than no hat. And the trader must feel that £15 in his pocket is better than no sale. But the reason why we've settled on £15 isn't a consensus or a moral correction. It's not that somehow, on reflection, I think it's really a £15 hat. Uh, or that the seller thinks it's really £15. We must still believe that it's 10 and 20 respectively. Moreover, it's not necessarily fair or equitable or just. Say I'm a rich tourist and it's a poor local trader. Uh, I can, the poor local trader may really need that 20 pounds. Maybe he's really entitled to it. I mean, it's, and he might sort of say, or be thinking, <coughs> my, my starving children. Uh, as a result of this. I, I, I could really do with this £20. But if I'm in a position, because I've got the money and he hasn't and he requires it, I can, I can use my bargaining position to get something which isn't necessarily equitable or fair. So compromise doesn't have to be, in that sense, principle. Now, compromise is often thought, as I've already said, to be best when it's shallow when it involves what I've just described as a classic trade, where in my example of the two, uh, the trader and the buyer over the hat, they've simply split the difference. Uh, or you could imagine something rather similar when uh, they're engaged in, in bartering. So it could be, you know, there we have money, but maybe there would be services that we could, we could exchange. And you'd still have a compromise. But behind these trades, unless one believes that everybody can name their price, there are often normative principles involved. In other words, the way in which we come to define the particular policies that we have, that we want, are defined by our particular view of, um, of, of the world, of, of what we regard as being the moral goal. So, in the political world, say, one party favours uh, giving scholarships for schooling as its way of, of uh, improving access to education. And another party favours uh, improved housing and other social benefits because it believes that, that edu people will get more out of education if there's greater social welfare spending. Those, their attachment to those two policies reflect different normative positions and and so a kind of you can have so many scholarships for so much social welfare policy is something which is going to be much harder for them to agree on because the policies which they are trading are defined by the principles that they have so shallow compromises of the are going to be harder because there isn't necessarily a common currency and there are limits to what we might wish to barter away. Uh, that, to barter away the immediate, this is Edmund Burke, he said, all politics is about trading and compromise, but no one would be willing to barter away the immediate jewel of his soul. That's Edmund Burke talking about the American Revolution. Uh, and, um, and similarly, we don't expect politicians, or we regard politicians who simply would barter away the immediate jewel of their soul as being ones who are, that almost defines the corrupt 
politician, for one, who can always find the price. But if that is the case, then how is it that you're ever going to get coalitions between parties going? Well, I think how you do it is through what I call a deep compromise, where there's a negotiation of the principles. And what was rather interesting about the coalition agreement that was formed between Conservatives and Liberal Democrats is that what enabled it to get going was that they agreed that they all they shared three principles: freedom, fairness, and responsibility. And that, that was going to be the organizing elements of their of their um, of their agreements on policy. But of course, they hold very different understandings of those principles. The, uh, <coughs> by and large, the, the Conservative Party has a more kind of individualistic view than the Liberal Party, which is, on the whole, more left of centre than, than many Liberal parties in, in other political systems are. Uh, and but nonetheless, because they were able to forge a kind of overlapping views of these, they were able to trade different policies. So, for example, it became possible for uh, the Conservatives to give up one of their most cherished policies from the uh, election campaign, which had been to... Um, remove taxation on inheritance. They wanted to get rid of inheritance duties when you passed. Uh, instead, they, they were able to agree on the Liberal Democrats' policy of raising the, the taxation threshold for the poor. So when you start paying tax. Um, but one of the ways in which they were able to do it was they offered an alternative. They were able to do it in terms of their view of freedom, fairness, and responsibility, even though the Liberal Democrats were justifying it from a slightly different way. So it was through a series of, as I say, deep compromises around different interpretations of the same principles that they were able to then do a certain amount of trading on their policies. Nonetheless, not everything can indeed be traded or compromised on. And there were two other strategies that one can find to deal with this, which I call trimming and segregation, which are, so trimming is when you seek to remove uh, a policy uh, from the agenda in various ways by, by getting a third party or some other group to decide it uh, for you. Uh, uh, or or you, you agree to disagree about, about that policy. So for example, um, one of the rather bizarre instances was that it was decided that on a number of issues, the Liberal Democrats could abstain when voting. Uh, they didn't need to vote for a policy. They could speak against a policy, but they couldn't vote against it. So that meant the likelihood of that policy getting through Parliament went up. But uh, nonetheless, they, 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 um, they could speak against it. So Britain renewing its nuclear deterrent, which for cost reasons is probably not going to happen anyway, um, that was one of the policies that the Liberals trimmed on. Segregation is when you take it out of the normal policy process. Uh, and that's happened. There were 11 commissions set up to decide what were disputatious policies. So some of those policies um, are things like, for example, uh, the voting system. Uh, we had a referendum on that, so it was handed over to the electorate to decide, away from the politicians. Uh, whether there should be a British Bill of Rights, that is being decided by a, a, a commission which has supposedly non-party members on it. 
So these have been the ways in which they, they deal with these things. But this has to be peripheral to the main issues. On the whole, if you're to have a coalition, you've got to have deep compromise and deep trimming and segregation at the margins. So I think we can uh, make a distinction between shallow compromise and deep compromise in terms of a distinction <laughs> that John Rawls drew between what he called a modus vivendi and an overlapping consensus. Uh, a modus vivendi is where you get an agreement which is simply based on a contingent balance of forces. And that one isn't necessarily fair. That's like the rich tourist trading with the poor local trader and forcing a compromise upon them, which isn't, is to the advantage of the rich tourist uh, and to the disadvantage of the, the local trader. Say, instead of they split the difference so that it's um, 15 pounds rather than 10 or 20, it's 13 pounds, uh, and therefore in the favor of the rich Tories. And some people sort of said, that's what the Tories should do with the Liberal Democrats. They say they should, they should have just gone for a minority government, or they should tell the Liberal Democrats that they're the smaller party in the coalition and therefore shouldn't be getting so much. So a lot of Tory right-wingers, particularly in the light of the recent uh, local election losses, have said this has all come about because the Liberal Democrats have got more than their fair share. And that's shallow compromise talk. But a deeper compromise, such as the coalition agreement, involves to a degree an overlapping consensus, such as you've got around those, those uh, three principles of freedom, fairness, and responsibility. Uh, though, although it's overlapping, it's not the same. So there are still, I would prefer to call it an overlapping compromise as opposed to an overlapping consensus on those principles. Now, Rawls thought that that was only possible if you had an underlying agreement on political principles, on the principles that defined the rules of the game. But one of the interesting things, which is shown by the, the uh, coalition between conservatives and liberal democrats, is there's no such agreement on political principles. In fact, it's there that they disagree perhaps the most because the Liberal Democrats would prefer proportional representation. The Conservatives are overwhelmingly, not entirely, but overwhelmingly uh, in favour of the plurality system. And the Liberal Democrats are very committed to being part of the European Convention on Human Rights, on, on the current Human Rights Act, whereas the Conservatives are in favour of having a new British Bill of Rights, whatever that may be, uh, and quite a few of them would prefer to withdraw from the European Convention on Human Rights. So on political principles, there's huge disagreement there. Uh, and yet there's compromise uh, of a deep kind uh, at the heart of what they're doing. So. My conclusion in the first part is that uh, you need deep compromise uh, of a moral kind in order to, if, you, if you're going to succeed in having any form of stable uh, agreement between parties. Shallow agreements are highly unstable. So for example, you know, if one looks, the mean duration for a majority government in the UK is uh, 50 and a, uh, and a half months, 50.5 months. For a minority government, they normally last, on, on average, 17.9 months, a lot less. Whereas a coalition <coughs> lasts for 43.4 months, by and large. Uh, 
almost as long as, as a majority government. And indeed, one of, the, one of the main planks of the Liberal Democrat Conservative Coalition was that they would stay in power for the full parliamentary term. They did that in order to bind themselves together to the agreement, rather than allowing one party, particularly the Conservatives most likely, but could be either, to take advantage of, of calling a snap election if it became electorally uh, important for them. So, argument so far is that compromise can be, has to be of a moral and principled kind. But how does it fit with democracy? That's the, the next element. Well, compromise goes, I think, with what you might call a, a democratic ethos. Accepting the need to compromise seems paradoxical, and in the same way, and for the same mistaken reasons, that democracy can seem uh, paradoxical. Why is that? Well, the conditions under which you might accept democracy are those where you accept political equality, you accept that there is disagreement between parties, and yet you also accept there's a need to reach a collective decision, despite all of that. But those are precisely the same circumstances which give rise to a compromise. If you remember right at the beginning I said that you get compromises in those situations where you have disagreement, and yet need to agree despite it. Bullheim, I described the, the, the paradox right at the beginning in terms of wanting potentially two incompatible things. But that arise is out of the circumstances of democratic politics. Because what happened, what, what you have are two different levels in your decision. So when I think we ought to have public spending, more public spending to get us out of the crisis, that's my contribution to political disagreement. That the collective decision is that we adopt austerity measures. That's, that's what comes out of what Volheim called the democratic machine. Uh, that's, that's, that's the solution. That's not my view. That's my view of the collective view. So in a certain sense, there is no paradox because each view is an answer to a, a distinct and separable uh, uh, question. One is, what's my view? The other is, what's the democratic view? And one is a contribution to the, demo, to the disagreement. The other is the way of resolving it. Peter Singer has, he, in a book on civil disobedience and democracy, called democracy a fair compromise. That's not entirely correct, I don't think, because in a certain sense, as he understood it, it makes, I mean, if you're, uh, uh, your commitment to democracy can't be a compromise, because if you're agreeing to democracy, you're agreeing to, to there's a consensus that democracy is just. So democracy itself isn't a fair compromise, but it is a fair way of making compromises. In other words, if you're committed to democracy, you're committed to the fact that you're likely to produce compromises. So the commitment to democracy is, on this argumentation, in a sense, a commitment to compromising of its very nature. Now, as I said, Volheim calls democracy the democratic machine, and that makes it sound mechanical. And in old politics, actually shallow compromise potentially does allow you to agree simply by holding on to your own views. Because one thing that we know is that when you have a, an election between left and right, 
but that's the dominant cleavage in politics, then the median voter is what is called the Condorcet winner. That is, the, the party that wins in such a left-right uh, uh, competition is the party which satisfies the most, the highest ranked preferences of all of the voters. And that means that no voter is likely to get their, their top preference. So in a sense, what you produce is a, a compromised candidate. In other words, imagine that everyone has put their preferences for the types of hats they want and how much they'd like to pay, etc., and rank them all down. The £15 hat would be the Condorcet winner, and that would and so parties, actually in left-right competitions, converge on the £15 hat as the winning election programme. But elections are multidimensional and involve uh, reasons. Because if I just if I simply went to vote simply in order to get a particular policy um, passed, then the likelihood that my vote influences the the uh, election is so small that uh, there'd be no point in my going to the polls. So one of the reasons why we know that people go to the polls is to express their views as in terms of certain principles. Now, as, as politics moves and becomes more multidimensional, and it's not just about interests, but also about principles, then the need for politics and democratic politics to engage in deep compromise goes up. So now, let me turn finally, because I realise I'm beginning to run out of time, to... Uh, Because if that's to happen, if politics is to be about compromise, then it's going to be involved representatives doing it. And is that possible? Well, standardly, there are uh, three forms of representation that you find in, in the literature. One is representation of delegation. <clears throat> and that tends to invite the view that uh, you can get shallow compromises, at least on means rather than ends. So what you do is you, you're voting for politicians, uh, and politicians are mandated to pursue certain ends, but they can compromise over the means by which they might be uh, achieved. The trouble is, as I said, that's just shallow, and on the whole, representatives can't avoid compromising over over ends as well. So the views, one common view is that if they do that, they must be acting as trustees. But then, if they're acting as trustees, that seems to involve compromise without a democratic mandate. Because basically what they're saying is, you should trust me just as somebody who knows better than you. You're trusting my judgment uh, about what ends you should pursue. And not simply about the means. But on the whole, we tend to think that the democratic uh, decision-making uh, should involve representatives feeling that they ought to be pursuing the ends that their, that their electorate wanted them. So this leads then to the third view of representation, representation as reflection. Now this is sometimes thought to have to involve the representation, representative body somehow being a mirror of the general society. And that view is generally thought to be an impossible view to, to, to get, because how can you take all of the different characteristics of everybody in society and exactly mirror that within the legislature? But what we're actually seeking to mirror in the legislature is not every characteristic of everybody, but simply one characteristic, their characteristic as political reasoners about ends. So 
What representatives should do when they engage in compromise is to reason as their voters. So, for example, a great deal has been made in the British coalition <clears throat> of the fact that the Liberal Democrats abandoned a policy pledge, which was uh, a pledge not to raise student fees, which we now have done. Um, uh, but actually, if one looks at the history of elections, policy pledges are very, very rare in elections. I mean, because they're almost always broken. George Bush, read my lips, no new taxes. New taxes followed as night follows day. Um, so it's very rare that the politicians do that because it's almost impossible to do. What legitimates it is not that they then abandon what the electorate wanted or that they act as trustees. We know better than you. It's only legitimate to the extent that the Liberal Democrats reasoned as Liberal Democrats and the Conservatives reasoned as Conservatives and engaged in a deep compromise on the basis of that reasoning. And it's because politicians, if they do that and represent the reasoning of the electorate, that they're able to, to compromise uh, and that becomes possible. So to conclude, Democracy involves everyone feeling they have an equal input into policy decisions. That's one of the merits of the democratic mechanism. And what I've tried to suggest is it's compromise that makes that possible. But it makes it possible to the extent that you have a deep compromise of principles that respects voters as reasoners on policy rather than a shallow compromise on policies, which, to a degree, are not what really figure in elections so much as two different, or three or four or five different visions of the world and how society should be. However, sometimes compromise, and I started by suggesting that we have a moral dilemma in modern societies, the more pluralistic they become, the more compromise you might need. There is a problem about that, because in a certain sense, it's only going to work to the extent that people do feel that they share a public sphere and they have a, an equal interest in decisions and are capable of forming a common stock of values. If, if you get to a state, which I think seeing politics simply about shallow compromise is likely to put you in, where you seek to trim and segregate absolutely everything off the agenda, or more and more issues, then I think what you'll ultimately end up with is people feeling that they can no longer be part of the same democracy with each other. Uh, I think that's beginning to happen in the EU now, but it's also happening, interestingly, in, for example, the UK, where you see the Scots and, to a lesser degree, the Welsh, beginning to want to separate out from a common democratic sphere. So compromise doesn't solve everything. There are certain pluralistic divides it can't overreach. But I think the degree to which you can begin to make democracy work for more and more people is by allowing it to be deep compromise rather than, as is often thought, simply shallow compromise. Thank you.